Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're just getting a few more participants in from the waiting room and then we'll get started. All right, well, welcome everyone to NCME's webinar series, COVID's Impact on Assessments. This is webinar number seven. Uh, so far in our first six webinars, we've tackled some really interesting topics. We've talked policy, psychometrics, logistics, practical issues, all kinds of things. And we've largely been focusing on assessments in K-12. Today, we get to shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about credentialing examinations. And when we started thinking about how COVID has impacted credentialing, you know, we couldn't help but immediately go to the administration challenge. When all of this came down upon us about a year ago, it was almost a year ago now, uh, the first thing that a lot of credentialing programs realized was they couldn't administer their tests. And so where we had looked into and started into the world of remote administration and proctoring years before, many programs that hadn't taken a closer look at this topic realized they all of a sudden had to get up to speed really quick. So today we wanna to focus our session just on that, on remote administration and proctoring in credentialing. And I'm very excited for the panel of speakers that we have here with us today. So again, the impact on assessment series, I've kind of got the full list that's there. Hopefully you've been able to join us for some of these. If you have not, if you've missed one that you're really hoping to learn more about, check out the NCME YouTube channel. They're all posted there as well today's. And then we've got three more after today. So today we're gonna to have a panel presentation and discussion. Uh, I'm your moderator. My name is Susan Davis Becker. I'm so excited to be a part of this and to have this great slate of speakers here. We have two panelists representing uh, credentialing programs. First is Liberty Munson from Microsoft Worldwide Learning, and then we have Kimberly Swigert from NBME. Uh, we then have Amin Sayer from PSI Services. Amin's going to share the vendor perspective with us and what it's like to be working with programs as they evaluate remote pro proctoring and administration. And then of course, we can't talk about remote proctoring and administration without thinking about security. So Jim Wallach is here to kind of present that perspective to, uh, to us and share some of his thoughts on where we are. We've got each panelist has some session or has some content that they would like to share with us and they're gonna talk through a few important things. Uh, and then I've got some questions I want to ask of them, but feel free at any time to add your questions to the chat. We will try to integrate those into our discussion as we go. So let's dive in. Okay, I'm going to ask each of the presenters to kind of introduce themselves as we get to their slides. So first we're going to hear from Liberty. Hello, um, I'm Liberty Munson. I'm Microsoft Psychometrician. Uh, essentially, it's my job to ensure that whatever tool or process we use to evaluate skills and abilities uh, is valid and reliable so that at the end of the day, when someone says they're Microsoft certified, they truly have the skills that they need to be successful. I have been at Microsoft for uh, just over 14 years doing the same job. So I'm a little bit of a weird um, weirdo at Microsoft because people tend to move from job to job, but I have a unique set of skills, as I like to say. Um, and so I've been uh, helping the program um, in their technical certification space my whole career here at Microsoft. All right, if you go to the next slide, what I want to do is just introduce you a little bit to the Microsoft um, certification program to just give you a background on the perspective that I bring to this panel. 
Um, so you know, our micro, our exams are delivered worldwide. You can take them anytime, any place um, with online proctoring from anywhere. Um, they're computer administered uh, and they include a variety of item types from your more traditional multiple choice uh, kinds of things to drag and drop uh, build list. And we also even recently added some performance based in labs, um, lab types of items in our, into our certification exams. If you go to the next slide, I wanna just talk a little bit about our program. In 2018, we completely re reimagined our certification program. We recognized that with, the, with more and more jobs moving to the cloud, that we needed to really focus on a more job role-based solution that enabled people to prepare for these cloud-based uh, jobs and make them more productive and, and effective in their organizations. So we basically identified three major categories of certifications that we offer. The first is a fundamentals, uh, which is really just this entry level. Do you have the basic skills and abilities and knowledge related to the core technologies Microsoft has? Azure, My, uh, Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365, Power Platform, Data and AI, and so on. So pretty basic, and I, I said skills, but um, really not skills-based, really more knowledge-based. Uh, but role-based and specialty are really about skills and abilities and things like that. Role-based is um, intended to tie to specific job roles that leverage Microsoft's technology to be successful. Specialties tend to be the, are, are intended to be not job role specific, but something that someone in a job role might have, like SAP on Azure is a good one, networking for Azure admins and so on, or it crosses multiple job roles. So it's not something somebody, um, every person in that job role would need, but a specialization, hence the name. Um, if you go to the next slide, just to give you a feel for the size of our program, um, this is this is what I'm dealing with <laughs> all of the time. And so I just, uh, this is, if you, and then the next slide is just the rest of this poster. Um, but just to give you a feel for the number of certifications that we're trying to deliver around the world um, uh, in the global space. The one thing I will add is that Microsoft was one of the, um, I think actually go two slides past this. Um, if we go one more, yep, this is the one that I was thinking was next. I, reason we got into online proctoring was because uh, we wanted to do something that would be more accessible and more convenient for our candidates. We were trying to increase reach. Um, and what we were trying to do is really embrace what Microsoft is all about, and that's the cloud. We are a cloud-based company, and if we're going to deliver exams, it seems silly to send people to brick and mortar. So in 2014, we were actually the, the very first large IT certification program and probably the largest certification program to start uh, delivering exams through online proctoring. So I have a lot of experience um, in terms of the online proctoring delivery method. Um, and so that's the, I think the real insight that I bring to this panel. I'm not sure who follows me. I think it's Kimberly. Oh, I have one more slide, sorry. So this is the, this is just the quick overview of what the OnView experience is. This is our online uh, proctoring platform. But the idea is, is that you schedule it just like you normally would. And when you go to take the exam, you start the exam the way this particular implementation works is there's a greeter that walks you through the ID vendor verification, the room scan. Um, and then once that greeter has confirmed that you're ready to go, they hand you off to the proctor. And in a seamless integration, you may not even know that there's a proctor involved because the proctor is only there to um, let you know when it seems like you might not be following the rules to remind you what those rules are and things like that. But for most candidates, they don't even realize that there's somebody else in the room with them. And so I think that's actually my last slide and I will turn it over to Kimberly. Okay, great. Liberty, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for being here today. So I'm Kimberly Swigert. I'm the Director of Test Development Innovations at the National Board of Medical Examiners in Philadelphia. I'm a psychometrician here at the board. I've been here for over 18 years at this point. And uh, in addition to getting to thinking about interesting things in terms of test development innovations, I'm also the director of several cross-functional units, including the teams responsible for exam construction, multimedia creation and management, and application development to support those innovations and process improvements within test development. Um, what I've been super interested in as of late is the potential of NLP, natural language processing, and data visualization applications for solving uh, some well-known test development issues, including those related to content generation, item bank management, and review for test security purposes. 
So next slide. So I'm gonna begin with the tale of two MBME exam programs. And the first is the program for which we're most known in the licensure space, which is the United States Medical Licensing Examination. So this is the exam series that physicians must pass in order to apply for general medical practice license within a US state. It's a computer-based test administered per metric continuously, uh, national and international centers as one day exams for step one and step two CK, and as a two day exam within US Prometric Centers for step three. And so next, sorry, I added animation just to make things more entertaining for Susan. Um, the other exam is the MBME subject exam program, sometimes called shelf exams at US medical schools. And these are content specific exams in the areas of basic and clinical sciences that medical schools can purchase for students to take during and after coursework with grading guidelines provided by MBME. So these are normally administered as CBT linear forms at medical schools via a secure browser on computers within a testing lab at the school with trained medical faculty and staff serving as in-person proctors during the testing. So remember that for later. Okay, next slide. So let's start with the USMLE program. So obviously, Promercic closed down when everyone else did and reopened centers according to regional government timelines. The eligibilities to register and test for USMLE were extended out for a year for free and a short delay in testing, while not ideal for examinees, was not necessarily going to put them at great risk for missing all the important milestones for licensure. That much said, there was a desire to avoid major hurdles, especially for step one and step two, because those scores are sometimes used in medical schools for advancement and graduation and are used by residency programs as admissions criteria as well. So when the shutdown happened, it wasn't so much a case of trying to avoid a single point in time delay with USMLE as wanting to avoid clogging up the pipeline uh, leading from medical school graduation to residency to licensure. And next. So because of this, we conducted a thorough evaluation of the potential for development of a remotely proctored at home USMLE. And during this evaluation, we found some tools to be quite valuable, including risk assessment sheets, uh, market consideration, and scanning the landscape. Next slide. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about the risk assessment part. So putting together a risk assessment sheet involves first identifying all the major areas of risk for an exam program, which can be things like test development, administration, legal, security, reputational, and so on. And then you identify all possible risks you can think of within each area. And the table shown here has some example risks that could apply to a lot of exams. So this is a risk of something that could happen if you move your exam to a remotely proctored um, scenario. The goal is to compile a complete list of risks where the most informed stakeholders for the program can then provide a rating of the likelihood of that risk occurring and the impact of the risk should it occur. And it's important to consider these separately in terms of how they apply to your particular program. Um, an overall rating for a given risk could be very high, even if the likelihood is low, if the impact is high. So the real world analogy here is airline pilots. Uh, they train for many bizarre scenarios, like both engines failing simultaneously and having to land in the Hudson River. Uh, but the likelihood of that's very low, but the impact uh, would be catastrophic for the unprepared pilot. So likewise, to use one of the example scenarios shown here, the limited ability to perform pilot and field testing, um, if your exam requires a lot of content, if it has a high volume, if it's high stakes, uh, if it has a blueprint that changes often to match updates in practice or curriculum, which a lot of licensing exams do, then even if there's a low likelihood that pilot testing capacity could be limited if you move to a remotely proctored exam, that could have a big ripple effect for that particular exam program with a high impact, and this might have an overall very high risk rating. And it's also a good idea to think of risk scenarios that may evolve after implementation of a remotely proctored exam. So for example, you could think what impact would implementation have on other parts of the organization, such as customer service or exam security incidents. If you move to a remotely proctored exam, even if it all works well, 
Uh, is there a potential for increased volumes of calls from examinees or increased exam security incidents? And do you have the capacity to handle those? Okay, next slide. Although I am not seeing the slides at this moment. Sorry, Susan. Here we go. I, I just restarted. I had a message that a couple of folks weren't seeing the slides. So hopefully oh, now they're back okay. up. Okay, cool. But now you should see them again. <laughs> now I see them again, okay. So here's some overall lessons learned for USMLE, um, in addition to the value of that risk assessment exercise, which was extremely valuable for us. Um, first, surveying your examinees is a good place to start because depending on the length and complexity of the exam and the tech requirements, your examinees might not be as eager to test remotely from home as you previously thought. Uh, second, scanning the environment for other programs like yours is key because we saw several programs roll out remotely proctored licensure examinations under heavy media scrutiny. And we were watching closely as well. We got to observe what worked and what didn't. And we were able to check in with peers at those organizations as well. And third, we learned, and Amir will probably say some more about this, there's a lot of remote proctoring vendors available out there. And so the vendor vetting process should be detailed and the results of that worked back into the risk assessment exercise, because that is going to inform likelihood and impact of some risks. And so next. In the end, USMLE chose not to move forward with remote proctoring. Instead, we found another solution that used volunteer medical schools to host secure machines and live proctors for students who wanted to take step one or step two CK before the Prometric centers were all fully reopened. And NVMe is going to continue to scan the remote proctoring landscape moving forward. So next slide. So our second exam program was a different scenario. So when everything shut down, medical schools ceased on-campus instruction, but they were able to move quickly to online instruction and still needed the subject exams. Unlike with USMLE, these were time-sensitive testing scenarios linked to courses and course completion. And these required a solution that could be implemented very quickly. The next. So if you remember the scenario that I mentioned earlier, where proctors were already embedded in medical schools, NVMe leveraged that infrastructure to deploy the exams remotely to examinees while they were also logged into a common video conferencing tool with the regular proctor who would have been observing them if they were testing in person um, on the call with them. So this was a scenario where proctors knew their examinees because they were students at those schools and they were able to observe them and proctor them via video conferencing while the students were testing through a secure browser. Next. So we have several lessons learned from this one. First, gathering the voice of the customer uh, before we did anything was extremely important because we observed different comments and attitudes and responses with this exam program than with the USMLE program. Second was that we saw the chance to implement a remote proctoring scenario that didn't require the use of a remote proctoring vendor by using the infrastructure that was already in place. Um, we looked at what we had and we came up with a solution that was satisfactory pretty quickly. One of the challenges in doing this, and this applies to any remotely proctored exam, is that moving to this type of scenario can lead stakeholders to ask, well, we're willing to do it this way, why would we ever go back to doing it the previous way? And that's something any exam program would have to consider. We're gonna to have to continue to consider it because the debates about the most effective ways medical schools can safely educate their students are probably gonna go on for some time. And finally, the last thing to remember is that the work on both of these programs represented where the remote proctoring space was in mid 2020. That space was changing rapidly even while we were evaluating all of this um, due to technological advances. So even once decisions are made about remote proctoring, um, they should be reevaluated as more information becomes available. And at that point, we can turn it over to Amin. Hello, everyone. My name is Amin Sayar. I'm Vice President of Psychometric Services at PSI. So PSI is unique in that we have a, a breadth and depth of uh, testing across a lot of different areas including pre-employment, hiring, talent assessment, talent management, career readiness, you name it. Uh, but uh, my area of focus is in credentialing. So that's licensure and certification. And for the past 13 years, I've uh, been in psychometrics and with a focus on credentialing. 
And the last eight of those years, uh, I've been at PSI in a number of different roles. So I'm very involved in uh, both ICE, that's the Institute for Credentialing Excellence and Association of Test Publishers. I have an industrial and organizational psychology background. And uh, I lead a team of psychometricians, test developers, and others uh, in providing services for hire uh, to certification and licensure clients. So that's me. And uh, yeah, I also have uh, animations. I love them. So thanks, Susan, in <laughs> advance. So first off, I already mentioned, you know, we provide a lot of different services uh, and, you know, they're, they're for hire. So we often say they're, they're customized consulting services. Um, and that includes the uh, delivery of tests for organizations that have the capability and willingness to create their own content, create their own examination forms, and we simply deliver it. Uh, or also that we engage in the, with them in the design, development, evaluation of tests. So that's job analysis services, standard setting services, item writing, item banking, uh, equating, exam assembly, all of that good stuff. Uh, and of course, every client is different. You can advance. So I want to say thank you, uh, Jim Fallon style. We're so grateful to work with such a variety of testing applications. Uh, and for me, it's such a perk to work within the organization and see things that are going on uh, in a lot of different testing applications, a lot of different market areas. But for us, even within our psychometric services team, you know, somewhere around half are healthcare certifications. But amongst the other half, there's such a variety there too. I mean, even within healthcare, there's a lot of variety, but engineering, IT, you know, legal spaces. Um, we see a lot of different things and it is very exciting to see uh, what the different considerations are, what the different populations have expectations of, what their testing experience really needs to look like. So you can continue on. So like a lot of other organizations uh, that have, you know, testing technologies, we invested heavily in remote proctoring and a handful of clients were already using it prior to 2020. But there's a lot of you know, hesitation of, let's look and see who's doing it. Let's see what we can learn, which is totally fair. Every organization has a commitment to quality and they don't want necessarily to, uh, you know, not all of them want to be the early adopters. Nevertheless, and you can continue to the next, then 2020 and since, the de as you would expect, the demand has grown significantly. So a lot of organizations have been very quickly thinking about what is the future of testing and also how do we service our candidates right now? Uh, and so we've been leading them through that process. You can go on to the next. So sometimes I do tell clients who are, who are really reticent and really nervous, I say, remember, remote proctoring is really who's watching them. Are they in the next room, in the same room, that kind of thing? Or are they watching them through a webcam remotely? That's really what it is but that's selling things a little bit short. So I did wanna say that even with sophisticated platforms, well-laid plans, and there are several out there, great technologies from really smart people, who, you know, very uh, robust uh, and, and mature organizations. So even with those great platforms and great plans, there is work that needs to go into any operational change and it shouldn't be underestimated. So across three different areas, I'm going to talk about specific things that, well, we should always consider as we think about those operational changes. So the first one I talk about is policies and procedures. Sometimes our clients think about this in terms of the business rules for candidate testing. So now that we're looking at remote proctoring or multimodal uh, approaches, we have to think about retakes and rescheduling. There's all kinds of different approaches here, right? And in terms of, uh, test center availability, there may be different uh, you know, uh, prerequisites in terms of how long should somebody wait before they can retake and reschedule. And now that it's available much more quickly, does that change our mind in terms of how long people should wait or not? We also think about examining infractions. And this one is really interesting. Of course, just like in a test center, if people do something that's uh, not what's expected, then there are repercussions, there are consequences. And so figuring out exactly what are the rules in a remote proctoring setting where do you get a warning or for this or do you get uh, automatically disqualified, right? And so a great example of a warning is people, you know, a candidate tends to like keep gazing over to somewhere other than the computer. The proctor will say, hey, 
you should be looking at the computer versus an infraction that's an automatic disqualification is seeing somebody you know, actively cheating, uh, trying to uh, work with uh, uh, somebody else who's feeding them answers or something like that. We also think about whether this is a live proctor or if it's recorded. And then lastly, I'll point out that the proctor examinee ratio is one that should be considered as well. Just like in a test center, it's not always the case that it's one proctor watching one candidate. Uh, so we wanna think about what is the right ratio so that the proctors can do their job effectively. So then I move over to measurement equivalence. So this is something that a psychometrician like me is thinking about all the time anyway. But here's some things that I'll, I'll think about. When we're thinking about different modalities, we really should be thinking about, well, how is the testing experience different? Is the technology different for the test driver? Is it different for the proctoring mode? mode? We have to think through all of the specific things that could potentially cause a change. And also for us to remind ourselves, are we looking for analogous outcomes or equivalent outcomes? When we did the same thing way back in the day, uh, paper-based testing to computer-based testing, we were thinking about it pretty similarly, right? There are changes in people's, there are variability in people's testing experiences. At what level should we be thinking about, is it close enough? Of course, when we think about statistical analysis, we want to identify, can we aggregate data across modalities? Do we keep them uh, separate? What kind of information do we get uh, when we well, when we make those decisions to aggregate or keep separate, or maybe best of both worlds to do both. One of the other unique things about remote proctoring is there are a lot of technical issues, a lot more than in a test center. So incomplete testing sessions, uh, you know, tend to pop up a lot more often. So how do we deal with those? How do we make sure that we have good rules about excluding people that are incomplete that don't really have sufficient data? For us to use for statistical analysis or to create a, uh, or to determine a passing outcome. And then lastly, cheating. Jim's going to talk about this a lot, so I won't, I won't steal too much of it. But one of the things that I thought was clever, I had a, I was speaking with a non-psychometric friend in the industry. We were talking about this kind of thing, and he said, so let me get this straight. We want, we know there's never going to be zero cheating, so we actually want about equal levels of cheating so that it's not causing a, an undue influence on the interpretability. And I thought, yeah, in a realistic kind of practical way, that's kind of the point. If we want to have equivalence or parallel outcomes, then the idea is that there's not this undue influence of cheating that it's so much more of a risk in one modality or another. But I won't say too much because we have a great expert who will talk about it. And then let's go to technology and implementation. So we have to think about data transfers and reporting. Who gets the, the data that comes out of these systems? And with all kinds of technology, it's never just the click of a button. Sometimes there's APIs and certain software development that needs to happen for systems to talk to each other, uh, to talk to the LMS that you're using, for example, or candidate management system. We also think about security safeguards. Of course, with a new technology, we have to think about different exploits, different attack vectors, and how we plug those gaps. It's different kinds of cheating, right? It's the same basic stuff, but it's different kinds of avenues that people might look at when there's a, a different proctoring modality. Of course, there's setup and configurations, and then exam scheduling is potentially different as well. When we're thinking about a test center, then it's clear, you know, uh, during business hours, finding a testing session. But with remote proctoring, figuring out what are the rules of when people can take a test. Is it okay that I take it at 2, 2 a.m. local time? Well, those are all kind of considerations that need to be thought through for each program. So it is a lot. Uh, and so it is exciting, uh, but each one takes time. So I've got one more slide here. So a few key lessons as we've, we've been working with a lot of clients. So when about a year, a year back, right, March and April of last year, there were a lot of closures of testing centers. And so 
for programs that were multimodal, the decision was kind of made for candidates. They had to take RP or they had to wait. But now that uh, it's a lot more freely available and they can select, it's pretty obvious that examinees know what mo modality they want. They tend to stick with it through retakes too. And about one quarter select remote proctoring. And honestly, I was a little surprised. I thought that number would be higher, but thus far across the programs that we provide services for, it's about one quarter. All right, so for the next one, even with system checks in advance, connectivity and examinee owned technology failure is common. Makes sense, but it's a lot. Uh, we thought we had really robust uh, you know, system checks. Actually, I say we thought, we know we do, but things still happen, right? We can check a day in advance that people have all the right system requirements. They have a good connection, stable connection to the internet, but power goes out, things happen, bandwidth issues, and sometimes just, you know, computer availability is just not the same as in a test center when we can control it. And also, we think about privacy. You know, early on, we when we talked about RP, one of the big things that was true is we thought about convenience. Folks will love remote proctoring because it's so much easier. You don't have to get in the car, or go somewhere, and for some folks, travel quite a long distance. But now it does feel like a certain uh, different expectation of privacy, right? If you're looking into my home, then I have to feel comfortable allowing a stranger to do that, maybe even a stranger that I can't see back. And so we always knew that privacy was a big concern, but it's certainly more widespread than anticipated. The next thing is uh, that I've al already alluded to a little bit is new security threats are attempted at a much quicker rate in remote proctoring than in-person test administration. There's always gonna be attempts at cheating, but there's more and more unique kind of zero day, as they say in the tech world, uh, first time it's tried out, uh, that can happen when we're, we're focused on technology uh, enhanced solutions. And so, we have to be even more on top of security threats, continuing to evaluate the threat landscape and developing uh, solutions to circumvent that. The next one that I thought was interesting is thus far folks seem to kind of self-select. Accommodations is a kind of a thornier issue when it comes to remote proctoring because some things are more or less feasible. What's already most common is looking for more time, right? Candidates want time and a half or double time and thus far, we've noticed that those who are taking remote proctoring are looking for that as the sole kind of accommodation. In test centers, there's also a subset that look for readers and things like that. At, at least up until now, we haven't seen uh, accommodation requests that have been other than additional time. And then lastly, uh, it's worth noting that accrediting bodies have certainly taken notice uh, it's not all happening in a vacuum. They are, uh, they are providing guidance and they are reacting and serving their uh, constituents as well. So the NCCA I, I called out specifically uh, because on my last year in the NCCA was right before, it was 2019. And we had already developed a plan in place to pilot remote testing, remote proctoring with uh, a handful of volunteer organizations that were accredited. Well, when the pandemic hit, didn't really change, uh, it, it really didn't change that plan, but it certainly increased the amount of attention and scrutiny people gave towards what was going on there. So NCCA specifically has recently provided their lessons learned um, that's, uh, that they made available and uh, provided some guidance on how organizations can continue to meet their standards uh, and, uh, and think about how remote proctoring might uh, affect that. And then lastly, the thing that I'll say is not everything we learned is completely generalizable to non-pandemic times. And the external environment is always changing. And so I always put that with saying, you know, I'll take all of this with a grain of salt. A lot of this is gonna be, is, is moderated by just the unique experience we are in right now in 2020 and 2021 and, and, and onward, of course, but there are going to be other things that continue to change the availability of test centers, the ability to uh, you know, travel without as many restrictions that may continue to change this landscape and we should always have our eyes open. All right, so that's for me and I'm excited to hand off to, to Jim. 
Awesome. Hey, thanks, Amin. Uh, so my name is Jim Wallach. I'm a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and issues related to test security, test administration, and detection of cheating on tests uh, tend to be pretty central to my research program. So uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different tact here and, and start by talking today uh, with regard to what I think are the most significant security risks posed by remote testing. Uh, and the first of those, which I think is actually probably the most significant risk, uh, is breaks. The primary problem with breaks is that once the candidate leaves the view of the camera, we lose control of that individual. Uh, they could be communicating with experts or other examinees, brain dump test content to a blog site, maybe even change places with someone. Uh, breaks also create a very real risk for time zone cheating. Um, so, you know, for, for all of these reasons, things like item review uh, following breaks is particularly problematic. But you know, if it's really unavoidable that examinees are going to come back to those same items following a break, uh, programs are going to want to work with their vendors and just make sure that they're collecting the type of process data that's going to allow them to review candidate behavior coming out of breaks to see whether or not the candidates are you know, engaging in unusual answer changing behaviors, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the real challenges with breaks is that credentialing tests tend to be pretty long. So uh, it might be unreasonable to expect that your candidates are going to sit for the whole thing without a break. Uh, and while it may be possible to modify the test time limits, um, you're probably not gonna be able to avoid uh, breaks entirely. Um, uh, even you know, if you shorten the test or anything like that. And, and Amin mentioned this, I mean, test accommodations are really the reasons uh, and extended time is the most common test accommodation that we see. Uh, many of those explicitly allow extra breaks. Um, so at least for some segment of the population, uh, I think there's going to be a significant security risk. Uh, next bullet, please. Uh, the next one I wanna talk about is, is the limited view of integrated laptop cameras. Uh, I'm using my laptop camera right now. So, you know, this is, this is what a proctor is going to see. Um, and think of everything that they won't see, right? This view doesn't show my hands, my desktop, my screen, or anything in my field of vision. Uh, and you know what else it doesn't show and never will, uh, even with a thorough room scan? Uh, next slide, please. This, uh, a phone literally sitting on your keyboard is completely undetectable. It's undetectable through your camera, undetectable by AI because the examinee is staring straight at the monitor and it's undetectable by forensics. Uh, an external camera that's positioned off to the side gets around these issues to a certain extent, but any one camera is going to have blind spots. So coupling the integrated camera with an external camera definitely a best practice, but, you know, credentialing exams and, and licensing exams in particular are among the highest stakes exams administered. So uh, not only should they be using external cameras, but I know that I'd feel a lot better if they were using external cameras that could be panned and zoomed, you know, discreetly at the proctor's discretion. Um, honestly, I don't actually even know if we're there yet in terms of technology. If we are, I suspect it's probably cost prohibitive, uh, but I really do hope that that's uh, the future. Next slide, please. Uh, so next, uh, examinees are largely in control of their own environments, uh, which means that they can get everything set up and, and you know, uh, they've got time to put everything together, put themselves in the best position to cheat. And there are going to be some candidates who try to take advantage of that by hiding HD video cameras in the room, by planning phones under the desk or in the padding of a desk chair, uh, inside clothing where you know even the most diligent check-in staff aren't going to be looking. Uh, unlimited access gives candidates unlimited time uh, so they can prep their environment and, and test out their strategies for compromising test content with a low probability of detection. Next bullet, please. The last risk I'll mention here is with respect to remote proctoring done exclusively through artificial intelligence. 
Uh, even if AI systems are good at detecting examinees engaged in inappropriate testing behaviors, if any of those behaviors are things that you're wanting to immediately stop, like a candidate who's taking pictures of your items, you really can't do that without real-time human intervention. Uh, finally, just a quick word of caution uh, with respect to these vulnerabilities, and, and that's don't underestimate the security risk just because the threat didn't materialize this time through. Uh, testing companies have always been playing a game of catch up with the cheaters. This year, maybe we turned the tides a bit because you know what we did was a complete unknown to them, but uh, it's not unknown anymore. So if we don't address our vulnerabilities, then people are going to be exploiting them. Um, so given that this is an NCME presentation, I, I thought maybe I would spend a, a few minutes also talking about some of the opportunities for future research around remote testing that I think needs some serious exploration. Uh, most of the research that I've seen has evaluated remote testing by comparing things like score distributions or pass rates against historical data. And, and that's good work and it's important work, uh, but I feel like we need to do more. Uh, to make sure that we're not just looking at some elaborate Simpsons paradox where things look the same in the aggregate, but are really quite different once you drill down. Um, same with flag rates, right? I mean, it's great. It's interesting to investigate whether the same proportion of candidates are flagged for potential cheating, but suppose it turns out that the base rate of cheating uh, in the two environments are quite different, right? It paints a really different picture. So. Uh, we need to give some very serious thought to how best to meaningfully compare proctoring quality and the security risk across different testing platforms. Next bullet. We've seen a lot of work uh, assessing whether remote test scores are equal to the usual scores. I think we need to be asking whether the scores are equally useful. Uh, and in particular, are there specific subgroups of individuals that we think might be at a disadvantage relative to others in terms of their being able to demonstrate their true proficiency? Uh, and are there important differences with regard to access, uh, either access to technology, connectivity, uh, or a conducive testing environment? I think there are also some really important equity questions that we need to investigate with regard to remote proctoring. Uh, I will be the first one to tell you that I am not an expert in AI, but I do know, for example, that uh, facial recognition software often works better for certain racial groups than for others. And I know that certain populations of examinees, like those with disabilities, may be more inclined to move their mouths when they read fidget in their seats. They could be more distractible and prone to looking away from the screen during the exam. And those are the sorts of things that a lot of these AI systems are going to be sensitive to. So uh, I would love to see some research that demonstrates that what's inside the black box isn't over flagging certain populations. Uh, and for those systems that use AI to route to a human proctor, I like that idea a lot but we absolutely need to be examining our implicit biases. Uh, next bullet, please. So speaking of this black box, uh, I would love some greater clarity over what it actually means when a candidate gets flagged during the test, particularly with AI, uh, right? With AI, I mean, it's a, it's a real mystery. And since there's so little actual evidence that exists to support a follow-up investigation, we have to get a better understanding of what it means when someone is flagged as anomalous. We all know that it's easy to build empirical distributions around variables of interest, flag the most extreme X percent, and, and then label those candidates as anomalous, but that doesn't actually make them cheaters. So uh, it would be tremendously helpful to have a better feel for what that real relationship is between flags uh, and actual prohibited behavior. Um, so. Thank you very much, and I think uh, we can we can move on. Great, great. I want to thank all the presenters for what they shared, and and there was so much great content in there to kind of think about and stew about. Uh, make sure to drop your questions or comments in the chat, but I've got a few that I want to to kick off with. Um, my first question was, uh, we and I think some of you touched on this a little bit, but. 
uh, I'm going to go to Liberty first. Uh, how, how do you evaluate the fidelity of a remote administration? So how do you define success and uh, just kind of as a standalone administration? So the, the, the key, the thing that we use to uh, define success is that the exam was successfully delivered and that the candidate, what there was no interruptions. It was as if um, they didn't even know the proctor was there. Everything just goes smoothly. No technical issues, no proctor interruptions. Um, and we do see for most people that is actually uh, what happens. But to uh, Amin's point about the technical difficulties, we don't have any control over the last mile excellence. So we do look at successful completions. We do look at how many, when there's not a successful completion, how much of that is candidate controlled versus how much is that uh, through our exam delivery provider controlled. So we do make that distinction and understanding how, much, how many of these errors when people can't complete are things that we have no control over versus the ones that we could control. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, do you have any follow up thoughts there? Because you mentioned, um, I don't know if you have a sense of what percentage of, of these run into technological issues, but how do you, is, is your definition of a successful administration the same? Yeah, I think, I think very similar, right? And it's, uh, you know, I, I guess I always think about any kind of remote proctoring across a few different ways. What is it successful in terms of a you know, measurement or psychometric perspective is that we have equally interpretable outcomes. I love the way Jim said it, so I'm going to borrow that phrase. It's not just similar outcomes, but equally interpretable. But then the other aspect, and I think Liberty nailed it, is the idea that there aren't undue uh, disadvantages or problems or disruptions due to a different technological problem. I, you know, I'm not a technology expert at our organization, or maybe not even a technology expert in any in any setting. So I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't know what percentage, but I can tell you that uh, there is a digital divide, right? Some folks want to take remote proctoring, but may not have the technology to support it. For a lot of people in the United States, their only internet-enabled device is their smartphone, um, and so they're required to take it at work or at a testing center or somewhere else. Um, and uh, you know, for many others, they may have an old computer hanging out and it seems to be fine. And then on the day they lose power and not everybody has the same access. Uh, so that is something with, that we need to think about and recognizing that it's, it's definitely a non-zero number. Um, the number of technical difficulties you know, should be considered. I, I, I'll try to fold in because I see a really good question down here of, well, what is the solution to computer and internet issues during testing? And it's a very good one. Uh, and I'd say it really depends on the, the length of the disruption. Uh, now, just like with breaks, there is a security concern here too. But sometimes we're thinking about like an internet connectivity problem lasts 30 seconds, minute, they're a blip, we're re able to reconnect, and we can continue uh, versus, well, I've lost all my power. There's no way for me to reconnect. Then it's a matter of rescheduling and figuring all that out. So it's a, it's a real problem with uh, not a clear solution, I'd say today, because it's a technology one and less, it's, it's less, test, less testing, more technology. Yeah. Uh, Kimberly, do you have any follow-up thoughts here? Um, I do not. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm very interested to hear about this as well. I will say that um, I was very excited to see both Amin and Jim's points about technology and access because USMLE was designed to be a lengthy exam. As Jim mentioned, licensure and certifications exams can be quite lengthy. Um, steps one and two CK, when you take them at Prometric, um, those are seven to eight hour exams. Step three is a two-day exam. Prometric uh, is currently set up to handle that and to handle any disruptions, to handle any technological issues that might happen. And I will say personally, the idea of having to be my own tech support if I were taking an eight-hour test from home would be a huge stressor. That would not be a scenario that feels very examinee supportive or centric. Um, because many of us work eight hour days and rarely get through them with Zoom meetings and email without something glitching or going wrong. So I think for us, it was 
it was really a challenge to think about an exam that had truly been designed for a, a streamlined and well-run brick and mortar scenario. That's not necessarily gonna translate easily to a remote proctoring scenario. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to add on to that, actually, when Microsoft first launched online proctoring, we, uh, uh, there wasn't a great amount of interest in it, quite honestly, and we couldn't figure out why, because it's like you get to take the exam anywhere, anytime, anyplace, why are people not jumping on this, but when we did the research, it's, there, there's two big reasons, one is that technological piece, like what happens if I have a problem, I got to be my own tech support and like add that on top of the stress of taking the exam. And I don't want to deal with that. So I'm just going to make the effort to go to um, a test center. And then the second big thing was having a disruption or interruption free area where many people knew that they weren't going to be able to find that space, um, which has become even more incredible, even more difficult in the current circumstance. So it I think that there are people who like it and when they try it, they do find it is probably better than what they thought, but that there's the certain amount of uncertainty about whether they're going to be able to solve any problem that happens and um, what happens if my kid walks into the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I was, I was going to ask uh, those of you who've, who've had experience with this, um, especially now during COVID, how have you had to um, or have you had to change any of your policies about the type of space someone can be in or those potential disruptions of a child walking in uh, due to COVID and, and people not having access to that space? So yeah, we yeah. have, uh, go oh, ahead. go ahead. No, no. So we have had, we have made some, we've tried to be as flexible as possible, but there are some challenges. Um, so like one of the biggest, um, probably oddly enough, the weirdest complaint or the biggest complaint that we get outside of the interruption is the ability to read questions out loud. And people don't understand why we don't want, why when someone's moving their lips, we think that's a huge issue. And it has to go to back to what Jim said about um, this fact that you have a limited ability in what you can see, right? So this camera, you can't see my hands now, and then you can. And so if you're reading a question out loud, how do I know you're not reading it to somebody who's recording it? And so it's a huge security risk. So oddly, that's the thing that we have had some of the more common complaints about. So we've tried to figure out how we can be flexible without appear appearing to be so uh, security focused that it's a, you know, this big, huge issue um, that's not candidate friendly in many ways, right? Um, and then in terms of who can be in the room, we've tried to give the proctors a little more flexibility in their um, willingness to understand what the situation might be, right? So if it's a kid that walks in the room, the concern is there's some, we can't, we can't record kids, right? We have some privacy issues that we have to be aware of. So we do have to end exams when a, a child walks in the room. And all of this stuff is, we're trying to be as flexible as possible, but still maintain the security of the exam and uh, some of the legal things that we have to control for. Well, Liberty said it better than I could, so I don't have much to add, but I will say that, you know, ha had this not been a pandemic, I think that a lot of the organizations that we work with would take a very hard line on who can be in the room and all of that. And uh, well, you can control your environment, but the fact is you can't necessarily control your environment right now. There are some constraints to what you can reasonably do. And I always say, well, I'm fortunate. I have a home office. This is my room to work and do all that. But not everybody has that, uh, you know, has that capability. And we just need to have that forethought. And dare I say a little bit of empathy, recognizing that our candidates are going to have unique needs. They're going to have uh, unique perspectives. And the only other thing I'll say here is I'm, I'm again, fortunate to have worked with a lot of different groups. And you see that different people have different perspectives, right? Different populations. If you're working with Microsoft, Liberty and her, her testing population, they tend to be more technically inclined than let's say physicians who aren't necessarily, they're using specialized technology, but aren't necessarily technology focused people. So they're going to have very different reactions in terms of what their expectations are for, um, you know, what that testing experience should look like. Yeah. So Jim, I'm curious your thoughts here on from a security perspective. Would you um, support a program kind of relaxing some requirements due to a pandemic, or say, hey, you know, if uh, we we still need a you you mentioned the same interpret interpretability of the scores. What are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, 
it's I mean, that's a that's a, a great question. I think it probably depends a little bit on on the nature of your program, uh, the nature of the candidates, the, the extent to which um, one of the things that you're trying to do is protect the public. Uh, I think that that really matters. Um, and uh, what's the likelihood of the particular security risk that you're kind of relaxing on? Mm -hmm. I think some things maybe were a little bit uh, more inclined to relax than than others. So I, I don't know. It's a difficult question to ask within a within a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's just a different. It's a different situation that kind of requires you to to re ask all the same questions that we ask with. Uh, computer-based testing or paper-based testing or whatever and, and kind of weigh those same considerations. Um, if, I, if I may, Susan, just back up a question uh, to, to um, you know, add something to the question about like what defines a successful um, administration, um, not really a, a security perspective on that, but I mean, I think, uh, I think that it depends. I think what we heard were um, sort of micro level definitions of what it means to be successful. And I think if you look bigger, I mean, for, for me, I, I would have a tough time saying it's a successful administration without waiting until after the scores are in and, and we have an opportunity to do some analyses on them, uh, especially, I mean, it's one thing for Liberty because I mean, you know, this is how Microsoft programs work. And so, you know, if, assuming you're not seeing any evidence during the administration, things, you know, may well be the same, but for programs that are shifting, um, I think they may not know for a little while uh, whether or not it's successful and, and are gonna need to do a bunch of analyses to see whether or not uh, the scores are as useful as they used to be. Yeah. That's great. So my, my next question, and I think it actually connects to a little bit of what's in the chat, um, was how do we define comparability uh, among or between test center and remote administration. And I mean, you, you gave us the great answer of the day, which is, well, there's equal cheating. Um, but I'm going to have you start with this one. Say, so how would you look at that and say, well, are these, are, is it a comparable experience? Is it a comparable score, a comparable result? How do you evaluate that? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a million dollar question, right? And I'd say that comparability, I, I think you, you, you teed it up perfectly means a lot of different things, right? There's a lot of different scales. Like we wouldn't be measurement folks if we thought about it as just a single composite score of it's, it's comparable or it's not. There's a lot of different ways we need to think about it. And I'll actually start with a really interesting question from Marianne, which is, are we seeing differences in response times? So my item is kind of harder to see. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of, let's say, differential item functioning in terms of results or uh, you know, response times at the item level. But on aggregate, we are seeing an interesting pattern. And that is people tend to spend just a little bit less, just, just enough to be noticeable, a little bit less time in remote proctoring. And this is my pet hypothesis. And that is that when you go to a testing center, it feels more of like an event and more of a, there's an opportunity cost for me to shut down the test and go away. Whereas, if you're at home, then it's like, all right, I'm done with the test. I've reviewed my answer if I wanted to, and I'm done. So we are seeing those. Now, if I saw a difference of like an average of five minutes, would that give me concern? Probably not. And so I almost think that the, I'm going to give this shout out again and repeat it. It's less about the comparability of outcomes, but comparability of the usefulness of those outcomes of those decisions. So got to give credit to Jim for that, that content, that comment of the usefulness of the interpretation, I think is key. If you find a difference and the average, you know, score is a one point different on the raw score scale, is that good? Is that bad? Is that okay? I don't know if we have the best answers for that. Uh, I think instead we, we need to say, are we, are there risks being introduced? towards the interpretation or validity of those outcomes. And if we say no, uh, I, I always say here that with remote proctoring, we shouldn't hold it to an impossible standard. We should hold it to a standard of, well, comparability. Sounds good. 
Uh, Liberty, do you, have you, did you look at any of this when you were making that transition? You mentioned the transition for Microsoft being largely driven around your business model and what the types of services and software that you're, that Microsoft provides, but did you, did you kind of look at it as you were making that move? So we did. And uh, what was interesting is when we first launched, I, I saw, um, I saw the passing rates between the online proctored exams and the test centers were really different and online proctoring was actually a lot less. It was enough, it was noticeable and it was concerning, but the way I, I wondered is if in this, this new, because we're like literally leading the way and people didn't really know what to expect. I strongly suspect that initially out of the gate, people thought that it was literally one-on-one, -on -one, that they had one proctor that was just like, the man watching them behind from behind, you know, like literally one on one kind of situation. And I think people learned over time. And so now we have seen that that that, you know, that's gone away and we see the same passing rates across modality. We see for the most part, the same types of um, item characteristics and, and things like that across modality. I will say that we have seen the faster exam times and online proctoring. So it, it was interesting to hear, I mean, talk about that because I wasn't sure if that was Microsoft unique or something that um, is a little bit more consistent across the industry, but it sounds like it's more consistent across the industry. Whew, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, you you brought up again the the kind of the comparable use of of scores, a comparable interpretation of scores. But what you know, how might you investigate that or explore that kind of what would be your scales as I mean mentioned? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, I think we need to define what we mean by comparability. Are we talking about comparability across um, like different testing environments? I mean, I, I think that's that's certainly something we need to do um, if we're planning on supporting both. <laughs> if if you know, a program just decides, look, we're transitioning. I think, I mean, uh, I, it's always a little disconcerting if if the numbers change markedly. But I think strict comparability is probably less of a concern in that environment. Um, comparability within uh, the the test different subgroups, different populations, and and all that you know is is an important fairness question. So, um, I I think um, I, yeah, and this, uh, this is a really important question because uh, in many cases the populations are going to be very different. But I mean, I think there are there are things that we can do. I honestly don't have a great answer for it. You notice I, I posed the question during, uh, <laughs> you know, during, during the talk, don't necessarily have great solutions, but, um, uh, you know, depending on how we define it, you know, there are things we can do with diff and differential test functioning, and we may need to collect different, um, uh, different background variables than we're collecting now, um, you know, depending on the nature of the groups that we're interested in. Um, but I mean, I think I think we can draw on the literature when we've done that comparability stuff before across different platforms, and we can look at the the transition to computer based testing uh, or to CAT um, relative to to what we've been doing. I, I have no real reason to believe that that those methods wouldn't be equally appropriate here. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I'll, I'll add in one more thing and say I think our research methodology skill set applies here, but we always have to remember. This is a field study, it's not an experiment. And so there are a lot of different confounds uh, that, uh, that are going to change the way that we interpret and recognizing that people are selecting and they're self-selecting which methodology that they wanna use for, for modality. And if we do see a difference in passing outcomes, is it because there's actually a difference in the proctoring modality or just people who tend to feel more confident, more prepared, and are, have higher ability are the ones that are going to choose one modality versus the other. We don't know, right? Um, but that could be, and I would, I would put in my two cents uh, or, or whatever wager that that is actually happening. And that explains part of the variability of why there are differences, um, small or large. Mm -hmm. That's that's a really good point, and you know, talk thinking about it as potentially a choice, potentially not a choice, just depending on the situation we're in. And there was a, a a question in the chat, which was right along the lines I was thinking of: is 
has anyone looked at gathering user experience data, thinking about that comfort? Like, did they encounter even just a minor technology thing they had to deal with that could have thrown them off for their exam? Has um, kind of looking across the panelists here, has anyone uh, thought about gathering that type of information or, or what that might, in, what questions might be posed to, to examinees about their experience to help understand those results? Well, I, I, I hate to put her on the spot, but I would invite Liberty. I've seen her present some really interesting stuff in terms of candidate experience and uh, not necessarily RP related, I, I don't think, right? Okay, I'm gonna stop well, talking. Go ahead, Liberty. So I, we, do, uh, we do actually get a lot of information on the candidate experience. Uh, we don't specifically ask um, about interruptions during the exam that are specific to online proctoring, but I will tell you what, what I know is that when people make it through the online proctored exam, and even if there's minor glitches, but if they make it through, they love it, right? They, they're very satisfied with the experience, but you know, when they don't make it through, they don't like it. And, we, and you hear about those um, pretty quickly when people know who to talk to. So, you know, Microsoft has a great uh, certification support team and for a variety of reasons, people know me, so I get a lot of them. Um, so, and I, when something goes wrong and it, it will go, it, you hear about it. And even if the person was able to get through, it's very clear in the stories that they tell about the experience that it likely did affect their um, exam experience. And that, that, that even being disrupted by a proctor saying, hey, you, you seem to be looking away a lot. Um, we need you to keep looking at the screen. So something even as innocuous as that, just that minor interruption can be very distracting to some candidates and they get out of the flow. And I, I don't have any actual hard data to support that, but I do have a lot of stories and anecdotal um, information from candidates who have had that happen and share their stories with me. Kimberly, is um, NBME collecting any of that data as they're administering this through this or the school as the schools are administering remotely? So those are data that we're collecting. Um, unfortunately, I'm not at liberty, liberty uh, to talk about the data at this point. Um, so I'm actually going to switch it back to something I can talk about, <laughs> which is somewhat related. <laughs> um, but it relates back to the, the overall question you just asked about um, assessing the customer experience. As I mentioned with USMLE, we chose not to go remote proctoring. And a lot of the risks that were discussed here and a lot of the security concerns and other issues, things about timing uh, were part of that decision, but we got a lot of value out of scanning social media and putting together the voice of the customer by just what people were talking about online with respect to remote proctoring as part of our decision process. And that's something that, again, we did it as part of evaluation of whether we should move to remote proctoring, but that would be generalizable for after the fact that you could, in, in addition to surveys, um, that you could look for. Um, I think we learned some very useful lessons from that. One is that if you're looking for things on social media, you're going to find them and it's probably going to lean negative because that's what tends to happen on social media. So you do have to be ready to, to take all of that into account, um, but we found it helpful to scan social media for people talking about our exams, for people talking about similar exams, for people talking about specific remote proctors, um, because that gave us a lot of rich data for sentiment analysis to look and see. And that was ended up, you know, uh, agreeing with other data that we were collecting to get back to the question of why some people choose to do remote proctoring and others don't. Uh, we were seeing that when students were preparing for big exams like step one and step two, part of their preparation was thinking, I'm going to be at Prometric for eight hours. I'm going to learn how to manage all of these tasks and all of this content and do it in this structured, quiet environment where it's somebody else's role to make sure everybody's quiet and everything works. And what we were seeing on social media agreed with survey responses that said people weren't as interested in taking USMLE at home as, as we thought. Um, so I think to get back to Jim's point about there's interesting research to be done out here, um, this has made me personally more interested in sentiment analysis and using data from social media um, and you know, seeing what's useful and what can support us as we make these big decisions for exam programs so that we can see what's kind of being discussed out there in the world 
and we can compare that to how students are actually doing, to what they're actually responding on surveys, to what other stakeholders are saying. So I feel like that's really rich data to mine that doesn't have anything to do with test performance, but could still inform some of the decisions that we make. That's a really good point. NCME 2022. <laughs> yeah. Analysis of some of that sentiment data. So, uh, uh, Amin, did you have thoughts about kind of, have you experienced that um, working as uh, on the vendor side about kind of what candidates think of one modality versus the other? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we routinely have, you know, candidate testing experience questions at the end of a, a testing session. And we've been mining that for what we've seen are the differences. And so I don't think this is going to be a total surprise. I'll tell you that some of the more granular things like the registration process, date and time of scheduling, like no difference, absolutely no difference. Uh, even proctor support and instructions, things like that, questions around that, again, very high and very similar. People are really satisfied with the, the way that it's proctored, the actual proctoring support. Uh, where it changes is uh, whether they choose the method again. Now, overwhelmingly, if they've taken it in test center, they want to take it in the test center. Now, it's still quite high where if you've taken it in RP, you want to take it in RP again, but it's a little bit lower. Uh, so the other one, of course, is uh, you know technical difficulties. People are experiencing technical difficulties. Um, noticeably more in a remote proctor setting. And so those are the things that they mentioned and they talked about. But the last thing that I'll say, if you've ever looked at this candidate data for yourselves, kind of analogous to the idea of like, what's the number one predictor of whether they're satisfied or not, whether they think they passed or not, um, the technical issues tends to be that close second. Uh, if they experience technical issues, they might rate it a little lower. Um, but if they didn't, then like Wilbur said, they're all in, let's do RP again, all day, every day. Um, and so we've noticed that those are the, the things that, that, that drive their decision. That's a, that's a really interesting uh, point to think about. And so I, I was thinking about it, several of you have mentioned kind of this idea of choice. And if, there, if we are in a world where there is a choice, someone could easily go to a test center or, um, or take it remote proctoring. And I'm just, I'm curious, uh, Jim, from a security perspective, would you look at any of that kind of choice behavior and see if they like potentially flag for security concerns or, or think about limitations on any of it because of security, like you've taken it twice via remote proctoring, you need to come to a test center or anything like that? Uh, right, yeah, I mean, I think something like that would be a good, would be a good idea. Uh, absolutely, I mean, I. I think you have to start with the uh, understanding that people are making certain choices for certain reasons. Um, and, um, you know, the, the business part of this, uh, of security, is that, you know, people are evaluating the risks uh, and the vulnerabilities uh, through the different media or through the different uh, uh, modes. And, if they think there's something there that they can exploit to their advantage, then yeah, they're, they're gonna choose that. I, I think we've been at uh, the in-person testing and the, you know, the computer-based testing uh, much longer. So I think it probably has uh, fewer vulnerabilities uh, uh, or at least I think we're more aware of what those vulnerabilities are. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would think absolutely we'd, we'd want to look at that and, and we might even find that there are different types of cheating that people, you know, are more likely to do in one environment versus another. And, and it might, uh, influence a little bit the, um, the nature of the post-exam investigations, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard supporting two different, uh, modalities. Um, right. There's an awful lot that goes into that. And, and so um, that's that's a decision that I would think uh, programs would want to not take lightly. I want to back up for a minute. There was some a couple of questions in the chat about what the AI experience is like or how that technology works. Um, so I want to ask if any of our presenters are, can, I know it's very different, right? It depends on the AI system, but uh, can speak to, can kind of describe what that AI 
system is really doing um, and what, the, what it's watching for and maybe even what it's flagging. I think, Jim, you mentioned a few of the f potential flags, but how it, how it all works. So my, my guess is that the other panelists may know more about this than, than I do. They, you know, it's, it's a black box to me because there's not a whole heck of a lot that's, uh, uh, that's out there as far as what it is. I can start by telling you what I think it is and then they can correct me. Uh, so I, I think it, it uh, the, the idea is that the system is collecting process data uh, throughout the course of an exam. And, and what that process data is, is gonna vary uh, you know, across programs and across uh, vendors, but it could be simple stuff like, like response time. It could be click data, um, you know, looking to see, hey, you know, these are math problems and interesting that this person's solving these without using the calculator consistently. Uh, it could be um, uh, eye tracking data and trying to attend to where they're looking and are they looking to the same sorts of places that most candidates look when they solve these questions. Uh, are they looking around the room? Are they moving around in their, in their seat? Is, right, is there movement that you wouldn't expect? And somehow those are quantified. Um, and there are, they're, they look at what's, what's typical behavior um, and identify you know, what a, how far out in the tail, depending on where they wanna put that flag uh, to say, okay, that's, there's more movement than we would normally expect. So they move into a different category. Um, and, and you know, I, I think uh, it's not too common that you know, just the flag alone, maybe in academic settings, this happens quite a bit actually, it's at least on our campus, uh, where the flag, that's it, there's no follow-up investigation. But I think uh, quite a bit, the flag would go to an actual person who would review, I guess, video of the footage um, but again, they're just seeing whatever's in the, in the screen uh, and making a decision about whether or not that unusual behavior uh, aligns with their expectation of what cheating would look like. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim is absolutely right. Yeah, he, he nailed it. Uh, I, think he's seen, I think he's seen it and he's not telling us uh, <laughs> because uh, yeah, that, that's, that's correct. And I, I'd say, you know, AI is a buzzword, right? Uh, but at its at its function, it's what Jim is describing, and it's really the automation of processes. That's that's really what we mean, and that can look a, very different in a lot of different settings. And so, I caution people to to think that AI is going to solve the problems, uh, but they are tools. Then they're great tools. They're very robust. Uh, and in the RP setting, uh, some of the ones that I can uh, I, I pulled up a a note that I can I can read off that our capabilities are. Things like gaze detection, identifying where somebody is looking, facial recognition, so taking a photo of the candidate at the beginning and monitoring that candidate uh, and com continually comparing it, uh, you know, to that to that photo. Uh, a motion alert, so is somebody moving a lot or just a little bit? I tend to be a little bit twitchy and move around in the seat. Uh, you probably have already noticed that, uh, but. Uh, being able to, like you said, uh, identify the thresholds, how much is too much, uh, auto detection of mobile devices or certain other contraband, right? So a shape detection of like, that is a mobile phone uh, and also an audio indicator. If the volume gets up to a certain amount, a certain decibel rating, um, then that, that information is all detected. But you can see with all of these cases, um, it all really depends on the rules, the policies and procedures we put around the certification program. Is it an automatic decibels hit 32 and above? Your that's an automatic disqualification test stops right there, or or what, right? Or more frequently, that's information that's fed back to a proctor who makes a decision, who might say, "Hey, that's a warning. That's really loud. Can you, you know, can you?" Or what? What I think is a really interesting one that, that happens a lot is grab your, your camera and move it around the room so I can see. So there isn't that pen that, uh, that can be controlled by the proctor necessarily you know, directly, but that is a common thing that we see that proctors use in their toolkit of move the camera around the room so I can see what's going on on your desk, behind you, around you, all of that type of thing. And so it's more frequent that these are things that pop up for the proctor of, hey, you might want to take a look. So the AI can inform the proctor who's who's monitoring multiple test taking uh, situations. You got it. All right. 
Interesting stuff. There's some um, interesting questions going on in the chat about legal challenges, and we probably won't dive into all of that today, but I do encourage you if you're interested to grab those links that folks are sharing. So those look like good resources. This video gets saved and will be posted to the NCME site, but the chat does not. So make sure to, to grab those. Um, We've talked a little bit about how the candidates have responded to this and about how, uh, whether they like it or don't like it or they're, what they're really looking for. I'm curious if other stakeholder groups have weighed in, whether it's educators, employers, members of the general public, um, if you have any thoughts on kind of, did you receive any feedback about, about that? And uh, Kimberly, I'll, I'll put you on the spot there to see if you've gotten any thoughts on, on how NBME has handled this and, and what feedback you're getting from different stakeholder groups? Um, actually, I feel like I addressed this a little bit earlier because I wasn't thinking just about examinees when we were talking about social media scanning. So I think that we were obviously most interested in examinees, but we know that there are groups that use our test scores. For example, residency program directors may use USMLE step one and step two in residency program selections. So I would say that we cast a pretty wide net, again, when we were considering the, the development of a remote USMLE. And I think there we were, um, we were getting into some, even if we didn't discuss it with the stakeholders, we were getting into some of the interesting questions about score interpretability that Amin and James, uh, Jim, <laughs> says James on his screen. So I defaulted <laughs> to that, uh, to the Zoom effect. Um, defaulting to the question of interpretability and comparability. And just as you would want to evaluate the landscape and survey and do social media scanning for examinee perspective on whether or not they think their scores are gonna mean the same thing, I think you would have to address directly um, groups that are using the test scores. I can't speak to the primary users of the scores, which would be the state medical boards. But I have to assume that there were discussions that were ongoing um, about what state medical boards would consider of changing an exam format for an exam like USMLE and that type of thing. So I think it all gets back to sort of interpretability and you may need to be able to have an argument up front about, yes, I can support the exam in both modalities. We can collect data to show that these mean the same thing. If it, and someone mentioned earlier about these being very high stakes exam, and that's true for an exam like step three, that's your final exam hurdle before you can apply for licensure within a state. So there, is, there are quite a few stakeholders there who would want to know that a remotely proctored step three would mean the same thing and could be interpreted the same way as one taken at Prometric. So not a question we ultimately had to address but something that comes to mind as, as what any licensure program would need to address. Yeah. Liberty, what about Microsoft? When you made this big change years ago, wasn't under the pressure of a pandemic, but rather a strategic move for your organization. How was, how was it received moving uh, with, again, employers, other groups who were looking at your, keeping an eye on your program? Uh, so we didn't really get a lot of feedback one way or the other from employers. Um, at the time, I don't know that it really registered with them well, that there was a difference or, or that they should consider that there might be a difference. What I will say is um, right now the experience, what we're hearing is that again, I don't think they care so much about the online proctor versus the test center. What they care about is when their employee or their uh, whoever it is, I'm gonna just say employee for lack of a better word, can't successfully take an exam because of some technology issue or something, that's when they care. I, uh, I will add my leadership team is kind of all in on the online proctoring. And I think if they could have their way, that's the only thing we do. It is, it has been a little bit of a struggle to help them try to recognize that not everybody can take an exam from home and not everybody wants to take an exam from home. So even though I think that their North star, as we like to say, is that it's all in the cloud because that's what Microsoft is. Um, It'll be interesting to see what the future holds if, if that's the direction we ultimately end up going um, versus the reality of what our candidates want. And there are certain parts of the world 
even in parts of the world that you may not think, I mean, like, I think we all recognize there are challenges in many parts of the world in delivering online exams, but even in some countries and that you wouldn't imagine there's a problem like Australia, um, there are problems with online proctoring right now because of some of the last mile excellence and bandwidth concerns that um, I don't think always are apparent in our uh, privilege of living in the United States where it's that's a less of an issue for most of us, although it does certainly affect um, people in the United States too. Yeah, I, I really like that last point. And I, and I think that like you, like you said, it even affects people in the United States. Not everyone has the same uh, bandwidth and access. Uh, uh, people live in more rural areas. And actually I live in Los Angeles, the you know, most populated metro area in the country. There is one testing provider. They're the only one in my neighborhood. So if they're down, everything's down. Uh, so it, it does, you know, it does uh, affect all of us. But we sometimes see that it's actually the opposite effect in uh, international testing, where finding a test center is incredibly hard, right? Even with organizations like PSI, Pearson, and Prometric, who have really robust international testing center networks, it's still hard. But being able to find internet sometimes is an easier proposition for folks uh, than finding a test center. And I would actually, the other thing I, I failed to mention, which I think is really clever here, is sometimes there's unique challenges and security risks when it comes to proctor collusion, when we talk about international testing. Not every, not every test center has that same expectation. Not every country or culture has that same expectation that the proctor is going to not be cooperative or be bought or be convinced <laughs> to you know, collude. So this does remove some of that and allows that to be more tightly controlled of who is the person that is, being, uh, you know, is serving as the proctor. That's a good point. I think um, one, as we're just about nearing the end of our time here, I want to piggyback off something that Jim started, which was, he said, hey, this is NCME. So kind of where do we need to go? Where do we need to think about for research? And so kind of give our, our presenters a, a last final thought to say where they think this might be going or where we need more research in this area to move it forward as, as a science, as a means of testing. Um, so since I'm just putting them on the spot, I didn't give them this question in advance. Who'd like to go first? And they all froze. <laughs> uh, I'll I give them a, give everyone, oh, go ahead, no, Liberty. Okay, I was. Just, I, I thought you had a great list of research, but what I thought one of the things um, that you mentioned that I just want to reiterate is this. I just and I think it's been said a couple times is this notion of the outcome, the equitable outcome. Is it this? You know, no matter what modality is, how are we demonstrating that it, the outcome, the result, is equitable and equal? Uh, maybe not equal, but equitable across the um, different modalities. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I outlined a, a number of areas where I think that research would be helpful in, in my talk, but I wanted to uh, point to something Lori Shepard put in the, the chat, uh, you know, a little bit ago about um, how valuable it would be if there were programs who were willing to participate in experimental studies, um, you know, here. That, that I think, uh, I think there's a, a tremendous amount that we could learn from studies like that uh, about uh, you know, the advantages, disadvantages, comparability uh, across different sorts of testing platforms and proctoring uh, platforms. I mean, Kimberly, what's on your research wish list for this area? Well, I'll go first because I'm sure Amin has more, so he can be the one who wraps up. Um, what I find myself thinking about is just the wealth of research that's already happening with online and remotely proctored exams in spaces that aren't as high stakes as licensure and what we can learn from those spaces. Certainly in specialty board certification and continuing medical education, we're starting to see more innovative types of assessment that are intended for learning um, and whether or not even if we don't have a future where a, a big certification exam that's your major milestone is something that can be administered in that way, I feel like licensure organizations have a lot to learn from what's happening in the non-high high stakes testing space. And I don't know that I have anything more specific to say than we figure out what we need to learn from that and we figure out what we can apply 
and we figure out where that fits within the certification process, um, whether it's pre-certification as a way of um, remotely proctored exams for learning that happened before you are certified, if it can happen further on in the continuing medical education space. I just think that's a huge issue and that our, our field has so much to learn from um, others who are moving more rapidly through, through interesting alternate exam administration platforms and remote proctoring ideas, so. Yeah, I, I, I think you got it. And actually I'll, I'll use my little soapbox to, to, to maybe try to wrap it up. And I think that the sentiment that you, you expressed in these last few comments in the chat is very much that, that cross-sector, cross-market uh, uh, awareness. And I think that's, that's such a great, this is such a great avenue for that. I think we have a, a lot of opportunity to learn from each other. One of the other areas that often comes to mind is in employment testing. You know, I have an IO psychology background and a lot of IO psychology like tests, like pre-employment are quite high stakes. And there's just a culture of many of those are unproctored um, mm -hmm. and they don't have those same concerns about cheating necessarily because, well, the motivations are different. The interpretations are different. The candidate pool is different. So it's not all the same, but we should always be thinking about this, you know, as well, what are other groups doing and why, instead of, again, having these impossible standards and having tradition guide us as opposed to, well, science and evidence. So I think there's a lot we can do, uh, but I think that, you know, generalizability is a, definitely a term I want to pull away from the chat of, we can always be thinking about, well, back to basics, what does it mean? for us to go through a testing experience uh, and what do the outcomes really mean about the candidates? Thank you, thank you. I wanna thank all of these presenters for such an amazing input and insight into today's conversation. Um, hopefully you guys can join us all next week. We're gonna continue our, our discussion on credentialing and talking more about policy and design issues that arose because of COVID. Uh, so please join us here next week for that. And uh, again, we, we so appreciate everyone being here. And if you didn't get a chance to hear the entire webinar, check it out on NCME's YouTube channel. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Great, thank you so much.